Hi class, Dr. Jim here. In this lecture, we're going to do the second part of animal evolution. And so we're going to look at now the vertebrate animals. And this includes a wide range of different animals, most of them being terrestrial animals. And so we're really going to talk about what made that movement from water to land today. Uh, kind of discuss some of the adaptations that had to take place. Again, a lot of it has to do with conservation of water. So again, the idea of uh, being able to conserve water, so a lot of times the outer coatings on the animals and what they have, either skin or feathers or scales. Uh, another adaptation is development of kidneys because, again, very important to maintain uh, water loss and osmoregulation. We're going to look at that more in Chapter 32. And then really the other really important fact, um, not only limbs and that stuff, but really the other important fact is the amniotic egg. And so we're going to talk about that. So that's a way to make sure that the embryo is protected, kind of like seeds and plants. And so we're going to look at that. And so you may be familiar with the amniotic egg if we think about birds with the hard shell or lizards with the soft shell. But humans also have the amniotic egg, but we don't have the shell around it. So most of the mammals, and including humans, have lost that shell. And because all of uh, pregnancy is internal, uh, you have internal fertilization, internal pregnancy, and then you give live birth. And so we're going to look at that uh, adaptation as well. And this is really what has established the animals, especially the vertebrate animals, onto land as we know it today. So let's take a look at the rise of the vertebrate animals and talk a little bit from where they started to where we are now uh, with the evolution and looking at those things. So the first thing we're going to do is obviously talk about when did the vertebrates first appear. And that happened right around 500 million years, right when you had that bilateral uh, symmetry forming. Really, you saw that Cambrian explosion, and that even gave rise to the vertebrate animals. We didn't really hit on it that much. We're part of the deuterostome um, phyla, if you want to look at it that way, or I, I guess maybe superphyla. And really what happens is that out of the deuterostomes, which means mouth second, uh, we came from the echinoderms and then from there progressed on into the vertebrate animals. And so we'll talk a little bit about the commonalities of all vertebrate animals and then move on from there. Uh, and then again, then we'll talk about what made the vertebrate animals come onto land. And so that's going to be really important. Again, what are the adaptations that allow for these to come onto land? Really, the first main thing was support and having that skeleton, but the second big thing was having limbs and being able to walk on land. And so we'll talk, talk about that as we go through. Then we'll talk about the amniotic egg. Like I've already mentioned that probably the biggest uh, role of adaptation or evolution that did take place uh, between the amphibians and the reptiles. So reptiles have amniotic eggs where amphibians don't. And so that really kind of moved the amphibians from just being in moist environments to the reptiles, which now can dominate many different environments, not only moist environments, but also very dry environments like deserts and that stuff as well. And we'll look at that. And then finally, how have animals, especially humans, affected the ecosystems? And again, obviously, humans play a big role in what we've done to the ecosystem. Obviously, you know, I'm not going to stand here on my soapbox and tell you what, what we've done wrong with the planet, but obviously, we have a chance to fix what we've done and we have to realize that we're what we're doing and we're losing species all the time and a lot of biologists have claimed that we're going through our next mass extinction due to humans and so there's been a number of extinctions in the past there's been i think five or six and so they're thinking that this now this time period now with humans and the 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 crisis with ecology, and we'll look at this especially with the amphibians and that stuff, that we're now facing our next mass extinction of a lot of species, and that's actually due to humans and ruining environments and destroying and destroying, and destroying the habitats of a lot of different animals. So we'll look at that as well at the very end and take a look at that. Okay, so where did vertebrates come from? And so again, vertebrates have been ocean's dominant predators for more than 400 million years. So between the time of 500 and 400 million years ago, we had the Cambrian explosion, which again brought the great diversity of animals. And again, you had that bilateral symmetry going on. And so what we saw was that at about that time, we see the first fossils of these vertebrate-like animals. And so again, some of our closest relatives in the vertebrate family don't look like vertebrate animals, but you start to see segmentation, you start to see uh, the notochord and some of these other things that that are really dominant features that we see in vertebrate animals. And so this happened, and I'm not going to even try to pronounce that name, but that was one of the first fossils of evidence of vertebrates, again, about 450 million years ago.
So again, the vertebrates are in the phylum chordata, and so if we look at our list here, it's way over here. Again, they're part of the deuterostomia, also the bilatera. And so the deuterostomia stomina means mouth second, and we're part of the relatives of the echinoderms, which are the sea stars and sea cucumbers and that, and the hemichordata, which are these long uh, worm-like uh, guys that are in the water. And then chordata, our name chordata, and all the species of chordata have some interesting traits, and we'll talk about that here in just a second, the four characteristics of all chordates and what they have. And so we belong to the deuterostomia, which means mouth second. So our mouth forms second, our butt forms first, our anus forms first, when we look at these different things. Now, all chordates share four distinct characters, uh, some which are present only during embryonic stages. And so again, all, all chordates have these appendages somewhere in their lifetime. And a lot of these things, especially in upper vertebrates, only appear in the embryonic stage. And we do see this when we go through development. We're gonna hit this all in chapter 36 when we look at development, but we'll just talk about this today and talk about the shared shared uh, keys of the chordates. So the first one is the notochord, which is a flexible rod providing support. In most of the vertebrates that one that you see during um, development, and then that notochord forms the vertebrate that you see protecting the spinal cord. The second one is the dorsal hollow nerve cord, which develops in the brain and spinal cord. I didn't mention this with the invertebrates, but one of the big differences between invertebrate animals and vertebrate animals is where the spinal cord is. In vertebrate animals, it's in the back. And so we have that dorsal nerve cord, spinal cord that's surrounded by the vertebra. In a lot of the invertebrates, the actual uh, nerve cord runs down the ventral end. So it's actually in the belly. And so when we dissect the earthworm and the crayfish in that step, when you lift off the back plate of the crayfish, you're not actually taking off the spinal cord, but it's actually underneath. And if you get all the gunk in the inside and all the digestive stuff on the inside, you can actually see the nerve cord on the bottom and the separation of the nerves from the nerve cord on the invertebrates. But in all vertebrates, this is in the back now. So it's moved from the ventral side to the back side, which is the dorsal side. And so all vertebrates have a dorsal nerve cord. You should also see these pharyngeal slits or pharyngeal clefts. Again, all vertebrate animals show this. Most of the time it's in development or the embryonic stage where you see this. And then these uh, uh, pharyngeal slits, and we'll talk again more about this during development, turn into different things. So in humans, a lot of times the first one turns into the jaw. The second one turns into the, like the thyroid and then the third one uh, and fourth turn into the heart and lungs and that. And so you see this development over time. And so in fish, they turn into gills In frogs. They start as tadpoles. So they have the gills and then they develop lungs and that stuff. And so, again, there's a lot of different things that it, that it turns into, but all vertebrate animals show these different pharyngeal slits. And then finally, a muscular postanal tail. And most vertebrates have a tail. Now, humans, again, are one of the few exceptions. Uh, again, amphibians a lot of times will have tails, but the frogs will lose them. Humans have a remnant tail, if you look at our coccyx and that, our tailbone. And so some people, the coccyx is turned the other way, and so they have a little stub of a tail on them and that, and that's just a morphological uh, thing that you see in some humans. But most of the time, the tailbone is curved in, and so we've lost our tail but when you land on it man does it hurt and it can be bruised and you can even break that part of your uh your skeletal system if you land just right on your butt so again that is some of the things and again when we're when we're in the embryonic stage we do have a long tail but it does recede during the time of development and so we'll look at that as well during in chapter 36. so again this is kind of the basic body plan and so when we look at the development we're gonna actually see this. And so again, the anus forms first, and so that's because we're deuterostomes, and then it forms and it makes its way to the mouth, and the mouth forms second. Here are the pharyngeal slits, and like I said, these develop into a number of different things depending on the animal, either gills or lungs or hearts or uh, jaws and that. You have the notochord, which is kind of the supporting cord, and again, in certain vertebrates, this stays as the notochord, and then the rest of the vertebrates, this turns into the uh, spinal column. And then again, you have the nerve cord with the brain on top. And so, and then you see the muscle segments. And so this is a very basic vertebrate animal. And we're going to see this in the lancet, which is the, the really the only non-vertebrate uh, chordate that's out there that shows these characteristics as an adult. Every other vertebrate 
actually has the spinal column and, and everything else. And so we'll look at this. And again, depending on whether it's bone or cartilage, that's another story. So again, we'll look at this as we go along through the different animals. But these are kind of the things. And so the four things, the tail, the dorsal hollow nerve cord, the notochord, and then the pharyngeal slits are seen in every vertebrate animal. And so that's what makes us all cordates. Okay, so again, like I said, the first group are the lancets and the, and the tunicates. Now, the tunicates look like this big kind of heart structure. They're actually a sessile structure where they stick to the side of a rock, but their larvae actually look more like the lancet. And so that's why they're included in this category, even though when they become the adult, they kind of become these sessile animals that don't really move at all. They look more like sponges. The lancet kind of is the basic chordate that we think of the developing embryo but again the lancet never shows the nerve or the the vertebrate structure so they are kind of called the non-vertebrate chordates these two don't have any backbone whatsoever they keep the notochord and then like i said the tunicate actually loses that as they become adults and so again the ancestral chordate may have looked similar to the lancet and then development took place from there and so that's kind of what you see now the early vertebrates, again, features of all chordates, the backbone, a skull, a well-defined head with brain and sensory organs. Again, this is the whole bilateral where you get the cephalization where you have sensory organs in the front along with the brain. And again, looking at this uh, transition, it probably happened during, during the Cambrian explosion, which we know about 500 million years ago. Now again, the rise of the vertebrates, again, around 500 million years ago, the early vertebrates were more efficient at capturing food and evading predators because of the way that they move, also the protection that they were getting from the development of the vertebrae, which is protecting, again, the dorsal nerve cord. And so again, uh, the earliest fossil records lack jaws, and so they're called cyclostomes, meaning round mouth, and that's the example of the lamprey or the hagfish. And you may have seen some of these uh, on fishes. So they're they're mostly parasitic as adults and what they do is they basically latch onto a fish and because they lack jaws they kind of grind their way like a sanding disc onto onto the fish and then they suck the fish dry and so that's typically what you see. But again they do have a vertebrae of uh, cartilage, they have the gill slits, uh, the hagfish which are these really slimy looking things and so again um, you can go look online and see what a hagfish looks like, but they look like these very slimy worms that have this mouth. They have the gill slits. They have these muc mucus glands on the back, and again, very slimy if you ever see one of these things, and very similar to what you see with a lamprey. And so these are really the, the ancestral vertebrates that we think of, and then we get into the other uh, fish as we go along. And so these are called cyclostomes because, again, the round mouth that's associated with them. They have this round mouth without a jaw that kind of, like I said, latches on, and then they, they're they more of a uh, parasite than anything else in these in these things. So really the first major adaptation in the vertebrates, besides the features that I just talked about, was the development of the jaw. And so what you see is that these skeletal rods that you started to see with the gill slits, and so again, a lot of people speculate it was the pharyngeal gills, gill slits that developed into the first jaws. And this made uh, predation much more uh, easy to do. So if you had these closing jaw mouth prints around the things, you could actually grab prey and eat it. And that stuff and so it was excellent for grasping prey and so again it was all this predator prey uh, type of relationship and here's a um, skeletal uh, fossil of one of the first uh, early vertebrates with the jaw in this and we call these guys nathostomes because they are the ones that have the jaw so nathostomes are jaws anathostomes are ones without jaws and so again there's the two types and again the lampreys and the uh, lampreys and the hagfish are the anathostones, whereas the nathostones are the ones that have the jaws, and so they have these clenching jaws. And so the rest of the animals that you see from now on are going to have some type of jaw that develops from the pharyngeal gill slits. And so the nathostones diverge into three surviving lineages. You have the chondrodictians, which is the cartilage fish. You have the ray fin fishes and the lobe fins, and then the humans and other are included in the lobe fins because we came from the water with the lobe fin fishes and so we'll look at that and so again really the three groups that are left are the chondrodictians uh, which again is the cartilage fish you have the uh, ray fin fishes which are again the actinoterogil uh, fishes which is the ray fin and then finally you have the lobe fin fishes which include the coelacanths the lung fishes and then the tetrapoda which are the four limbs on the surface. And so we'll look at these guys as well in a little while.
okay? So that's what we're looking at and, and seeing. So the first ones we're going to look at is the chondrodictians, which are the uh, the sharks and the cartilage fishes. And so again, these include sharks, rays, and the relatives. Again, here are all the different ones here, but there's plenty of more, plenty more out there. So any of the sharks, uh, any of the stingrays or rays uh, type uh, fishes, again, you, you see these a lot of times you can go pet these things at the zoo and do all those different things, as well as the sturgeon. A lot of people real, don't realize that the sturgeon, which a lot of people fish for here, especially up uh, closer to Green Bay and then in Sturgeon Bay and all that other good stuff, that these fish are actually cartilage fishes and they're more closely related to sharks than they actually are to the regular bony fish. And so we'll look at this. Uh, in a minute and talk about the bony fish, which are the rays and the uh, lobe fin. And so again, largest and most successful vertebrate predators. We still have them around today. We all know about sharks and shark attacks and that stuff. And these guys, the difference between these guys is that their their skeletal is all cartilage, where with us, it's bone. And so that's the big difference from the cartilage fish to the rest of the vertebrate species. And so the next one are the osteoecthes, meaning bone, bony fish, and so these are the ray fin fishes, and the ray fin means that they have spines for their fins, and so you'll see this a lot of times when if you've ever fished before, that a lot of times one of the defense mechanisms of these fish is they'll flip up their things to poke the predators with their spines, and so that's why they have these spines, and again, a lot of different fish that we think of, a lot of the fish that we eat, and that stuff are part of the osteoecthins and that, and again, containing the bony and endoskeleton, and then have uh, lung or lung derivatives. And so again, most of these guys have gills, but they also have some remnants of a partial lung in that. And we'll take a look at these here in a minute, especially with the lobe fin fishes in that. Again, the most aquatic osteothins are the ray, uh, ray fin fishes. And again, these are the bony with the rays and that stuff. And like I said, they have the, the, the spines to them in that. That's the ray fin. Okay, and then the low fin, which are part of the group, actually have more of a bony, uh, bony lobes, which actually allows them to come out of the ground. Now, again, these are the ancestors to the tetrapods because you're going to see that these things with these lobes are actually able and they have a bone structure in the inside that allow them to get out of the water. Now, this is a lung fish where they actually have rudimentary lungs supposed to it. And these guys actually crawl onto the beach and so they can actually come out of the water and breathe air outside and so we think that these are probably the first ancestors that came onto land and we'll talk about that here in a minute but the lungfish are probably our closest relatives to the bony fish in the water and that and again this gives rise to the tetrapods now this guy down here uh, is a real interesting a real interesting one this is the coelacanth and again this was thought to be extinct around the time of the dinosaurs but we actually found these fish again really deep deep water uh, back in the 1930s and so we know that they're still around they survived the great extinction and that stuff during the time of the dinosaurs about 65 million years ago but we thought they were extinct as well but we did find these things and again these are the lobe fin fishes that allow them to um, use them more as appendages rather than just as a way to swim in that in these cases okay so again Looking at the radiations prior to bilateral radiations, large marine eukaryotes were slow. But what you see now is with the development of the jaws and the fins, and that allowed for these guys to become greater predators. And so you also saw the prey develop defense mechanisms to protect themselves. So hard outer shells or skeletal systems to protection, you know, type of thing. And so you saw these different things. And this all happened during the Cambrian explosion. And so the nathostomes, particularly the jaw uh, vertebrates, have become the dominant marine predators for over 400 million years because they became the ones that went after things. And again, the successful adaptations and evolution over this time allowed them to become very, very successful. So this is the cartilage fish, the, the chondrodictes, and then the osteoecthes with the bony fish and the predators that they are uh, today. Okay, and so again, then you had several groups uh, facilitating their colonization on the land. And for the, uh, ca the Cambrian explosion, we saw with the invertebrates, there were quite a few organisms that actually came onto land and diverged at the same time and actually came onto land at the same time. We also saw this in the vertebrate animals. And again, really the biggest one that, that we know as the ancestral kind of tetrapod was these lungfishes. And this is called the 
uh, let's see if I can say this right, the Tiktaalik, and again, the Tiktaalik is the kind of the fossil ancestor of the lungfish, which actually comes out into the water and can breathe air. And so we'll see the fossil of this here in a few minutes. But this is kind of the ancient relative to the modern tetrapod, which is essentially a four-legged animal that's on, on the land. And so we'll look at this. Now, what did life, life be like when coming onto land uh, for the first time? And so these were some of the advantages and challenges that they had. First, an advantage was that obviously the atmosphere had more oxygen to it. So you didn't have to have gills, but you had to have some way to breathe. And so this was development of the lungs. And so that was one of the things, development of the rib cage. We'll talk about that and allowing for uh, better breathing. Again, there were new sources of few food and fewer competitors for that because, again, the, the, already the invertebrates came onto land. So there was a lot of food available along with plants. And so plants came out about a, a hundred million years before, again, the animals did. And so there were those guys there. A couple of disadvantages was water was scarcer. So again, you had to develop systems to protect yourself. So you had to develop your kidneys better. You had to um, maintain osmoregularity outside and you had to develop a way to reproduce because again, a lot of these guys require flagellated sperm and egg. And so how are you gonna reproduce? And so we'll look at that as well as the embryo. How do you protect the embryo from drying out? So that's gonna be an issue as well. And then temperatures. And so this is a big issue when you're on land, they, land they fluctuate a lot more water, tends to hold its temperature. And so you don't see a lot of difference in the overall temperature over a long period of time. Yes, water does warm up over the summer and cool down in the winter, but you don't see these very quick uh, rapid changes as you do on land where it can go from you know 30 degrees in the morning to 85 degrees in the afternoon and that. And so how do you regulate your temperature? And so we'll look at that as well. And then the biggest, another big concern is how do you support yourself against gravity? And so again, because the water would allow you to support your weight, now what are you gonna do now that water isn't there to support yourself? And so again, a lot of animals develop the exoskeleton to survive when they're small and allow them to do that. Other animals had the internal skeleton and again, that bony skeleton along with the limbs to support themselves, develop the muscles to support their bodies along the ground. And so that's gonna be a big uh, evolutionary advantage as well. Okay, so terrestrial animals, again, the members of many groups made it onto land. We saw this from the last lecture and that stuff. And again, arthropods came on the land about 450 million years ago. So they were established for about 100 million years before really the first major predators. Now there were probably some invertebrate predators to these guys, but really the vertebrate animals became the, the biggest predators to the invertebrates. And so again, the vertebrates colonized around 365 million years ago, at least that's the first skeletal uh, fossils we see. And so again, these are the lung and lobe fish that came out and were actually able to breathe the land and then they fed off the invertebrates and the plants that were already established on the land. Okay, so again, the evolutionary changes, we saw this last time again for the marine the crustacean to come onto land, there wasn't really uh, much of a, a need to develop new new systems. The only thing that they need to do is learn how to breathe on land. And so that was the tracheal system that we see with the insects. For vertebrates, there wasn't much of a difference except for the skeletal system, which was already there and in place in the fish. But the big thing was the development of limbs. And we saw that starting to go with the bony fishes or not, yeah, the bony fishes with the, uh, again, the limbs, the lobe fishes in those cases. The other thing that had to be derived is how are you gonna reproduce? And so we're gonna see this with internal fertilization so that everything stays wet. And then the other one is gonna be the eggs. And so again, how are you gonna protect yourself and how are you gonna protect the embryo once you're on to land? And so that was another major derived. Everything else though, was ancestral and so it was already in place ready to go it was just a matter of time for these things to come onto land and find new habitats to get into and so again developing the limbs and the the ways to protect themselves from drying out were the two main uh main derived characteristics with the vertebrate animals and again this was the thing so the limbs and feet so going from the, the lobes to the limbs that was a big thing and then the amniotic eggs and scales to protect themselves from water loss so that was going to be the next big thing so i i told I talked about this already the uh tiktalik is the name the fishapod and again this was the uh showing both the fish and tetrapod characteristics so it still had scales 
and fins. It had gills plus lungs in the case. Like I said, lungfish have both in that. But it also showed the tetrapod characters. It had a neck associated with it, ribs, uh, uh, fin skeleton, flat, uh, flat skull, and then eyes on top of the skull as opposed to the side. And so you started to see this for more predation in front. So you could see in that it also, like I said, had fins, gills, lungs, and scales, had ribs to breathe air and support its body. So that was a major advantage. Uh, a neck and shoulders, and then fins with a bone pattern of a tetrapad, uh, tetrapod limb. And so you could see it had a short little humerus at the ulna, and then you started to see the little phalanges starting to develop outside the, um, the, the fins themselves. And so you started to see actual uh, digits with these, with these limbs. Now, after you go, so the, the, the uh, teak tillich uh, could uh, prop itself up on its fins, but it could not walk on land because it lacked the digits. And so, again, what the biggest thing was now getting limbs with digits. And so you saw that uh, from the rise. So once they got onto land, they started developing more and more digits. And again, you start to see this in the animals where they develop these from the limbs. They start actually growing digits that allow them to grasp onto things and move. And so again, fins became progressively more limb-like over evolutionary time. And again, the first tetrapods about 365 million years ago, which spent most of their time now on land. So the one thing about all these guys before the limbs with digits, most of the time they spent in the water and they just came on to land briefly to breathe air, maybe grab some food and then go back into the water again. And so that was the big thing where these guys, the vertebrates that were now on land, spent most of their time now on land rather than in the water itself. Now, the first major group that we still have around are the amphibians. And again, this happened uh, around about uh, probably around four or about 400 million years ago with the amphibians. And again, this includes salamanders, frogs, and uh, caecilians. And again, the amphibians have gill breathing aquatic larvae that go into metamorphosis. So they do spend part of their time in the water as larvae, but then uh, as adults, they're out on the land. And so again, that's the first main thing. The big difference between the amphibians and the amniotes, which are the reptiles, the birds, and the mammals, is one about reproduction. So they still do external fertilization. So again, the male and the female ride on top of each other. And as the uh, female lays its eggs in the water, the male will fertilize them with the sperm. And so those will develop into tadpoles. The embryos are required to be in the water. So you're not going to have uh, eggs at all that are not on the land, they're not going to survive, and so they need to stay with the water. So that's a big issue with the amphibians is they're going to lay lots and lots of eggs because only a few of them are actually going to survive to adulthood. And so that's the big thing with the metamorphosis. And so that's what you see with these guys. And so again, with the amphibians, including those without the aquatic larval stage are restricted to damp habitats because they do breathe through their skin. So they do have rudimentary lungs, and we'll see this when we actually uh, dissect the frog, but these guys do have slimy wet skin because most of their uh, breathing actually takes place through their skin. And so they use that to do that. Again, their eggs lack a shell and are vulnerable to desiccation. So they use the water to reproduce. And like I said, most of their reproduction is external, where again, the male fertilizes the egg outside of the body. And then you see uh, them in the water and then they develop into tadpoles and eventually into adult um, adult amphibians. And so again, like I said, they have to have the moist skin. They need to be around water because they need to breathe through their skin as well as their lungs themselves. Now, the problem is, is amphibians are going down. And so amphibians are a really good measure of how the ecosystem is doing. If you have lots of amphibians, that means the ecosystem is thriving and doing very well. But what we've seen in the last 40 years is a very big extinction of amphibians. And it's especially because humans have moved into areas where the amphibians called home and we've destroyed their, their home. And essentially that's what's happened. So environmental change, the global warming crisis, along with the destruction of the habitats have caused many species to go extinct. And so you can kind of see. So the CRX is the ones that are in crisis. The EV means extinction. You can see the level of amphibians uh, that are in crisis right now versus the ones that have gone extinct. And the number below is the number of species that were there before uh, or when we first started keeping track. Now, these numbers were probably bigger at one time, but you can see how many that have actually gone extinct during this time, and especially in the last probably 100 years looking at these things. And again, 
probably the biggest ones are going to be in South America and Central America where we had a lot of uh, jungles that have now become farmland due to the migration of humans into the into the tropical jungles tearing those things down and then making that into farmland and so you see this and again also global warming has a big effect because it's drying out the land uh, you see pollution and other things that have destroyed the water and so again amphibians really can give a sense of how the ecosystem is doing and we've seen a big decline in the amphibian popula population in the last 100 years due, due to these um, different, different climate change and, and things going on. Now, the last major evolution, and again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, primates and that stuff here, but the really, the last major key evolution for survival on land was the development of the amniotic egg. And so the amniotes are a group of tetrapods who, tetrapods that actually include members of reptiles, including the birds and the mammals. And so what makes these guys special is they have the amniotic egg. Now, reptiles and birds lay eggs, and again, depending on soft shell, which is found in reptiles, versus hard shell, which is in the birds. And then mammals, most mammals do internal development with the placenta, and so they keep the amniotic egg inside, and so they don't really have a shell. There are a few that do, uh, but again, we'll, we'll, look at, we'll look at that and go. And so again, you can kind of see where these came from. The first amniotes, which were probably uh, ancestors of the amphibians, and then you saw the different uh, types of again the reptiles and birds and then you saw the other line going into the mammals which turns into the monotremes the marsupials and the placentals and again we'll talk about that here in a few minutes now again the amniotes are named for their major derived character which is the amniotic egg and again it has specialized membranes in the amniot chorion yolk sac and allantosis and again this protects the embryo it feeds the embryo and so the yolk is the nutrients that the embryo feeds off of you have the yolk sac you have the chorion, which surrounds us, and then you have the amnion, which surrounds the embryo. So the embryo develops on the inside of the amnion. And again, this is fluid filled that protects uh, really the embryo from the outside world. Now, again, like I said, in um, reptiles and birds, they have a hard, they have a shell. Now, in reptiles, this tends to be a soft shell, which they bury, and then the, the parents may protect those. Or in birds, they have the hard shell, which again allows for gas exchange and other things through the shells, but again, again, it's mostly for protection in these cases. Now, again, like I said, there's very few mammals that actually have the cell. Shells uh, slows the dehydration of the egg in the air, and again, most have lost it due to being the embryo inside, and again, internal development going on inside the mother. And so we'll look at that as well with the mammals here in just a second. Now, another important thing that also occurred was the development of the rib cage to ventilate the lungs. And like I said, even the lobe fish have the, had rudimentary lungs. Amphibians have a very simple lung where essentially it's just a big gas-filled bag. And so you start to see this. In mammals, we actually derived branches and made alveoli. And then the rest of them have a combination of both. And so most of them are air-filled uh, spaces. In the birds, they a lot of times will use this for flight. And so they fill up their, their spaces to give them more buoyancy in that. And so the way that they breathe is a little bit different. But you can see the difference in terrestrialization. So again, amphibians are kind of both uh, on the land and, um, and in the water. And they still breathe through their skin. But the rest of these guys rely on the lungs to do all their gas exchange. Very little skin, skin exchange anymore. This is all due to the lungs, and you can kind of see this as they develop into the adult as they go along. Now, again, uh, in living amphibians and amniotes split about 350 million years ago, and you can kind of see the difference between this. And so, again, you went into two directions, either the reptiles, which are here, and again, this is a list of a lot of the different reptiles that are out there, and then the mammals, and of course, we'll talk about the mammals. Now, birds are included in the reptilian um, uh, phylum, and they're kind of the subclass called the, the aves. And so again, what makes them different is the feathers, the wings, and the hard shell eggs, where the rest of these guys have tend to have scales, uh, soft-shelled eggs, uh, and then most of these guys have ectothermy, which means that they are cold-blooded, whereas the birds and the mammals all have endothermy. So that was a derived thing that the birds and um, the mammals actually developed on their own in this case. Okay, so the earliest reptiles lived about 310 million years ago. Again, in the reptile, they have the uh, tutaras, uh, the lizards, the snakes, and the turtles, and the crocodilians, along with the birds. And you can kind of see this here, the different species. 
And again, the birds originated from a common ancestor with the dinosaurs. And so we know that the dinosaurs and the birds shared a lot of the unique qualities. Some of the dinosaurs actually even had feathers or a prune, uh, kind of like these feather-like structures. So the scales started to develop into more like feathers and that stuff. And so you do see that they're more like dinosaurs. The other interesting thing with the dinosaurs and that and the birds is that they all had four chambered hearts, which again is more efficient. And so they think that the dinosaurs are actually warm blooded. And so that's one of the big differences between uh, the dinosaurs and the crocodiles and some of those other ones that are still ectothermy. And so you see that. Okay. So again, lots of different groups. And again, the birds are kind of on their own. Now, again, reptiles share several derived characters with one another. One of them is that they have scales, which is a waterproof barrier. They have internal fertilization. So unlike the amphibians, which have to fertilize outside the body, these guys have an internal. So the males have a penis, which will insert and fertilize the eggs internally. And then the females will then lay the uh, soft-shelled eggs in this case, and, and most of the lizards. Again, most are ectothermic, meaning that they absorb external heat to regulate the body temper, temperature. And again, really the only two uh, groups out of there that are endothermic were the dinosaurs and then the um, birds themselves. And again, they're kind of their subclass. And again, they maintain their body temperature through metabolism. And we're going to look at this in chapter 32. Now, the reptiles compromise two large clades. Again, you have the lizards and the snakes, the squamates, and the uh, two ataras, again, which are down here. And then the rest of them, the turtles, the crocodilians, and then you have the birds coming off here. And so, again, the dinosaurs are kind of in between the crocodilians and the birds, and they died off during the last one of the last great extinctions, which is about 65 million years ago, due to the big asteroid that hit the Earth at that time. Now, birds are a diverse group. Again, this is a subclass obvious. They used to be a class, but now it's a subclass because we know now they're more like reptiles. They're, they evolved from reptiles about 160 million years ago. They have weight-saving adaptations, and I'll show you this. They lack a urinary bladder. They don't hold urine. They actually make a paste with that, and so they make uric acid much like the insects do. Uh, females of most species only have one ovary, and again, they have small gonads except during the breeding season, which will get larger. And then they lack any teeth, but they do have a beak, a hard shell beak, which will do a lot of different things. Some of them are adapted for tearing and ripping. Some of them are for um, smashing seeds. Some of them are used for penetrating wood to then use their long tongues to, uh, again, gain, gain nectar or insects that way. And so, again, a lot of different things depending on what they are. Now, the other big thing is the air sacs, and again, this helps them fly, and so these are off the lungs themselves, and again, they hold the air in these things to allow them to um, get more buoyancy in the air and that. And so, again, this is a major uh, adapt adaptation for flight, again, where they use this to hold air, and then they expel it out during, during flight, and again, it allows them to create buoyancy in that in the air. Now, other adaptations for flight include the wings and feathers the large pectoral breast muscles, and so again, using that for flight. The keel on the sternum, so again, the breastbone develops out, so it kind of makes more of a keel like you see on a boat, so they can guide them from one, one direction to the other. The circulatory systems and respiratory systems, including the four-chambered heart, which we also see in the dinosaurs. The color vision and acute eyesight. Again, birds probably have the best eyesight of any of the predators because they can be very high up and go and grab that mouse from you know hundreds of feet up in the air. And again, well-developed visual and motor areas of the brain to adapt and respond to the prey that are out there and that stuff. And so again, just kind of looking, one of the interesting things is all the air spaces in the bone to make them lighter. And so their bone structure is very light uh, due to all the air spaces that they have. So allow them to get more buoyancy into the air along with those, uh, like I said, pretty much those airbags that they have that allow them to uh, take off and, and land and those things. Again, the feathers themselves, you can see that inside the feather, they have this barb and barbule and hook, so they link together, and again, that helps with the flight. And so these are, once were scales, but now have turned into uh, feathers, and looking at that, and then the wing structure with the arm, and then you can see they've kind of lost their uh, fingers, even though they have them in there, they're kind of uh, together, but what you see is that more of these become fused, and they become more like a wing-like structure in these cases. Now, the last major group to evolve was the mammals. And again, other than the ex, uh, ex, extinct uh, lineage of amniotes, they have the many derived traits, including mammary glands that produce milk. This is where they gave their uh, um, 
obviously their name. They have hair or fur. They have a fat layer under the skin that keeps them warm. They have the wonderful kidney that conserves water, and we're going to talk about that in chapter 32. The high metabolic rate because of endothermy. So again, they burn really well, burn calories really well to keep them warm because we have to maintain our body temperature of relatively large brain, depending on what uh, animals you're talking about. And then differentiated teeth, part of the jaw. And so you're going to see the difference between meat eaters and herbivores. And so carnivores and herbivores have different types of teeth based on that. And omnivores will have a mixture of both. And so again, we'll look at that more in the digestive system when we start talking about that. So again, one of the big things with mammals is the fur. They have the thick oily skin, so they produce oils that help again protect them from water loss. Again, they can get water from catabolic pathways, moisture in foods. They have unusually shaped nasal passages to influence how much air they get in. And then again, effective water absorption by the large intestine and the kidney. And again, most, most, of the, most of the water is again reabsorbed by the kidney and you only lose a little bit of water each time depending on how much water is in the system. So the more dehydrated you are, the less water you're gonna lose during urination. So that's gonna be one of the things. Now again, mammals evolved from the uh, synapsids and again, the first true mammals arose about 180 million years ago. So again, before the dinosaurs, so that was around the time, same time as the dinosaurs, but those were the primary ones. And again, a lot of people think that they, the mammals survived because they burrowed under the ground and they were able to survive underground for a long period of time. About 140 million years ago, you started to see the three living line lineages of mammals that had emerged. You had the monotremes, which are the egg-legging. So this is like the duck-billed platypus or some porcupines in that that actually lay eggs. You have the marsupials, which is the mammals with the pouch. And again, in this case, they don't lay eggs, but the embryos, will they give live birth. So they have internal fertilization, live birth, but then they have a pouch where the mammary glands are. And so the, the young will develop from embryos into young young animals in the pouch and so you see that over a period of time and so those are the marsupials the only marsupial here is the opossum that we have in um united states most of the other marsupials are going to be in australia and that and then the eutherians are the placental and so most animals are the are the eutherians eutherians which are again placental and so that means they have internal fertilization, internal development, and loss of all shells altogether. And so again, it's all internal in this case, and they use the placenta from mama to feed the baby. And so that's what's going on in these cases. Now, uh, we're gonna, we're, we'll look at some of the animals again. We're gonna talk uh, and actually dissect the, the mammal looking at the pig and that stuff. And so we'll look at that as well as some of the other ones as we go along and describe the systems. And so we'll get more into the mammalian systems uh, as we go along looking at the cardiovascular, the lungs, and all this stuff in the next few chapters and that stuff. Really, the rest of the semester, we're going to be doing that. Today, we're just going to focus on the quick evolution. And again, we're going to talk about the primates. Again, the primates separate out from the rest of the mammals because you start to see developments of the limbs, the opposable thumbs, uh, and then again, the development of the eyes, the skull, and the brain, which are going to be the biggest thing. And again, humans are part of the uh, primate group and again, as evolved from the chimpanzees and the gorillas and the apes. And so we're part of actually the great apes and that and humans have come from that, uh, from that uh, species or from those species. Okay, so again, many of the derived traits of primates and adaptations for life in, life in the trees include the grasping hands and feet, the movable thumb uh, monkeys have and monkeys and apes have the opposable thumbs which allow them to move and again rotating forearms we can move our arms backwards and forwards if you look at your dog or cat they can't do that so that's one of the big things that is different between primates and rest of the mammals the other thing that you see is the forward facing eyes again the eyes for predation and again giving peripheral view where a lot of times you'll see a lot of mammals have the eyes on the side of the head and those are going to be more of the prey so they can see 360 degrees or about almost 360 degrees around them in that and so again good forward uh, looking eyes so with good depth perception and again the other big thing is the development of the brain so one of the big things that has been lost in in primates is the sense of smell and so again we know our dogs and cats can smell much more than humans can and so but what we've gained is the visual areas so again cats and dogs have smaller visual uh, visual area but again primates including humans have a much better uh, depth of focus in that and very good eyesight 
and color eyesight compared to the dogs and cats that we see out there. Now, the non-human apes are only found in the tropical regions of Africa and Asia. Apes have larger brains to the proportion of their body size and more flexible behavior than other primates. And again, the apes uh, include the chimpanzees, the gorillas, the orangutans, and then uh, again, I think some of these are the apes and that stuff as well. So again, the great apes in that in these cases. Now, for humans, humans have come from the lineage with uh, the first one being the Australohippithecus Afri Afrinarians, and again, this is kind of the uh, kind of the ancestral um, ancestor between the chimpanzee and the humans, and so that was kind of the thing. This was the first upright. So one of the big differences between the apes and the humans is the bipedal uh, motion. So we've gotten off our four uh, for our limbs and we've gone to two limbs primarily for walking and we saw the reduced nature of our arms. Our arms have gotten smaller. Also the loss of the fur over our entire bodies and we've become more and less and less furry or hairy again in, in that as we have evolved. And so again you can kind of see the evolution. The Homo erectus was again standing tall. You saw the development of the skull in that and then the Homo neanderthalus and then the Homo sapien, which is our species today. And so again, you can kind of see the height advantage and the musculature in that, and again, bipedal and that in the length of the legs growing where the arms have gotten a little bit shorter over this time. Now, a number of characteristics distinguish humans from other apes. Again, the upright posture and the bipedal locomotion. So again, with the chimpanzee, they still use their arms uh, used for walking. So they'll walk using their arms. Uh, they have a longer pelvis, narrow pelvis, and the femurs are angled out. Or if you look at the uh, humans and the humanoids, the skull attaches inferiorly. So you can see here it attaches posteriorly, so closer to the back of the skull, where you see it's more underneath. Again, that's for the bipedalism and standing upright. Uh, again, you have the S uh, spine that's S-shaped, so it goes kind of down and out. And again, this is going to be more... Uh, slightly curved, it's going to be more straight. Again, the difference between standing upright and that shorter arms, uh, bowl-shaped pelvis. Again, a lot of that has to do with the bipedalism as well as uh, for uh, birthing and that, and we'll talk more about that when we get into development. And then larger brains capable of language, symbolic thought, artistic expression, and use of complex tools. And again, chimpanzees can learn quite a bit uh, in that, but their level of communication and, and again, complex thought and other things are, are lacking compared to uh, human species. And so that's, again, the development there. Now, chimpanzees are our closest relatives to the humans. And again, their genomes are 99% identical to our own. And again, that's the idea of shared genes. The genes are the same, but what changes is how we use those genes. And that's what we've seen over time. And again, you can kind of see the human ancestors. And so humans and chimpanzees from other apes evolved around about six to seven million years ago. And again, you see that you start to see that the extinct human ancestors comprise the homans. And so again, we've lost a lot of these, uh, we've lost all these species. And the only one that's left of the humans is the Homo sapien in this case. Now, bipedalism preceded evolution of increased brain size because we have some of these other or, uh, or uh, other fossil records, and again, the one, the Ardipithecus, Ar Ar <laughs> I can't say it, Ardipithecus uh, Ramicus, uh, Ramd Ramdius, showed signs of bipedalism, but had much smaller brains than Homo sapiens. And again, the other major development was the brain size, the body size, and tools, uh, tool use that increased over time in the Homo species. And so again, that caused the evolution to occur more in humans and eventually uh, due to this becoming into civilization. Now, the oldest Homo sapien fossils were from two specimens in Ethiopia. So this dates back about, oh, anywhere from about 195 to 160,000 years ago. And again, the all living humans have origins from somewhere in, in uh, Africa. And so if you do the 23andMe, they will tell you exactly where or not exactly where, but where your lineage comes from in Africa and that stuff and kind of derive from there and then European ancestors and that stuff. But they, they can trace back the gene and the genome to these African species and you can see where where in Africa or again the Ethiopian African uh, where the human uh, Homo sapiens have derived from. 
Now, humans dispersed out of Africa into Asia, then Europe, Australia, and the New World, and again spread. We know that in the New World actually came earlier than what we expected. It's not the European settlers because there were Native Americans already here, and they crossed the land bridge that was uh, there between uh, Af or between uh, Alaska and Russia during during the time, and this was probably during the last ice age that we had where there was an ice bridge and that humans migrated across this into uh, from Alaska and down into North America. And so this is about 10,000 uh, uh, 10, years ago or predates around that, about 10,000 years ago that came to the New World. And again, that gave rise to all the natives that were here before the Europeans came over back in the uh, 14 and 1500s at that time. And again, Vikings came earlier than that and that stuff. So there's some of that as well. But again, Typically, that's that's what we think of uh, with the spread of human um, civilization at a time. Now, DNA extracted from fossil human jawbone indicates humans were interbred with Neanderthals. And so, again, we know that Neanderthals were around at the same time as Homo sapiens, and then the Neanderthals died out, and the Homo sapiens became the predominant uh, species for human development. Now, the last little part we're going to talk about is how humans have transformed ecosystems. And again, we know this all very well of the human impact on ecosystems and what is happening. And so, again, the rise of animals from a microbe only world affected the aspects of the ecological communities on sea and land. And again, looking at these species shifts and that stuff, you have a wide range of of different things that take place. And again, obviously humans have played a huge role in this, especially during the industrial age and that stuff. Now again, human impacts and evolution, humans have changed the environment, altering selective pressures on species. And so harvesting have shown that ages in which uh, fish actually become more mature has gone down. And so you see the reduction of age and size in individuals that reach sexual maturity has actually gone down because again, due to the fishing and that, so fewer adults and so in order to make sure the species is spread, what has happened is that the fish have evolved and actually become sexually mature younger in life because now they can have more, more fish to survive so the, so the species can survive because again, human pressures, what they've done has been overfishing and so there's no adults left and so these younger, um, younger they're not really pups, but younger fish have to develop earlier so that they can replenish the species. And again, that can be due to human fishing and, and the things that humans have done. And we've seen this in certain fish where again, overfishing has driven the age of sexual maturity actually down in a lot of species because they have to replenish the population. Now, again, another species decline during human activity, rapid species declines over the past 400 years indicate human activities may be driving the sixth mass extinction. Talked about this before. There have been five mass extinctions during the life of life of the planet and that stuff. And again, you may have talked about this in 257 uh, and gotten to this, but there was five major extinctions. Again, one of them being the dinosaurs during about 65 million years ago. That was the last major one. And now a lot of um, biologists think we're going through the next or the sixth major extinction because of human effects. And so again, what we've seen of all these different species that have been going extinct, the biggest group of all of them are mollusks. And again, a lot of this is due to, um, again, looking for jewelry, for pearls, uh, uh, food and the mussels and that, snails and other things as a food quality. And then again, the other big thing is the climate change. So water pollution, uh, again, the damage to the environments and other things. And again, we've seen that the biggest one so far has been the mollusks but amphibians have been quite large, other mammals, birds, fishes, and insect, and insects, and that, and other invertebrates have been uh, also in, put in danger by human human extinction. And again, the, the reason for this is not only over predation, but then also, um, you know, industrial applications as well as climate change that have caused these different things. Again, threats on other species, major threats imposed on species by human activities include habitat loss, pollution, competition, or predation by non-native species and over-harvesting. And so you can see where we've seen a lot of damage. And so habitat alteration has been occurring from all these different uh, aspects of human life. And so again, because we tear down trees, we change uh, forests, uh, fishing, overfishing, habitat alteration, dumping chemicals in the water, uh, and then an overfishing, urbanization becoming more city-like, and again, pollutants in the air, taking the water, other things like this. 
You can see over harvesting, especially in the fishing and forestry, pollution due to our, our agriculture, again, jumping uh, fertilizer into the water, over fertilizing things and getting into the water, causing algae blooms, other things, urbanization, manufacturing, dumping uh, chemicals into our drinking water, and then also and killing habitats that way, throwing things into the lake, thinking that it will just wash itself out. Additions of other species, and again, bringing species over from one part of the world to another and creating non-native species that have now become uh, adapted. So like things like garlic mustard and some of these other insect species that eat certain trees. So like the box elder and some of the um, the other ones killing the ash trees, the, ash, the emerald bore, uh, ash borer and that stuff, which was brought in from Asia, brought from Asia and that and some of these other things that have caused the damage. And then obviously climate change, which has affected a lot of things. The earth is heating up. We've seen this general trend in the last hundred years that the temperature has steadily increased. And again, it keeps going up and up. We're melting the ice caps, which can have an effect on the rising of the oceans. And they've shown that in 20 to 30 years, major cities, if this continues on, are gonna be underwater because again, the oceans are rising due to the melting ice caps, the heating of the things we've seen. Uh, in intensity of storms due to the water temperatures. So hurricanes and typhoons have gotten worse because the water temperature has risen. We've seen incredibly high temperatures in the water that stay warm all the time. Around Florida, the average temperature now for the ocean is over 80 degrees. And so these things all play a role in weather systems and other things and causing more damage and destruction. And so, again, we need to do something, you know, again, I don't want to get in my soapbox today, but I probably already have. But we need to do something to affect the change. And so we need to stop the stop the negative effects and become more positive and do things, do things the right way. And I think a lot of people realize this and whether the government jumps on board or not right away, it's going to be our responsibility one way or the other. So we need to start doing our part and, and doing the little things to make the, the bigger change. So and I think people are starting to get that and understand that it's going to be important if we want to stick around for a while we're going to need to do something otherwise we're going to we're going to have to go live on mars because we're not going to have an ecosystem anymore to live in okay and that's it that's all i'm going to talk about there all right so we made it to the end uh and again vertebrates have been a major dominant feature uh especially in the oceans and the terrestrial land for more than 400 years and really the biggest thing there there was the development of the jaws and so again vertebrates have developed the jaws the jawed fishes and that the nathus stones and that, like I said, everything past that made predation uh, important. And so the development of that really made the predator prey relationships and become allow for the birds to become very dominant uh, in the different habitats. Again, animals that left the water have features facilitating their colonization on land. Talked about a number of the adaptations. Again, having skin that allows them to protect themselves from water loss. Having internal fertilization, we didn't talk too much about that, but again, internal fertilization is important. So now you don't have to rely on a different mechanism in order for the swim or the sperm to swim to the egg. You do it internally. You don't have to worry about that. You can conserve the water. The amniotic egg, which protects the embryo either outside the body or inside the body, and again, important for water loss. We think of the kidneys. Uh, again, maintaining osmoregulation. We'll look at this later on, especially in chapter 32. And then again, some of the other things that we developed, and we've looked at this over time, the development of limbs for support, as well as getting prey and grasping things and doing all those things. So there's a lot of different things that have happened. And like I said, the last one, the amniotes have had the key adaptations for life in a wide range of terrestrial environments. We're really the first after the ver or after the reptiles, we became the animals on land, predominantly on land. We only go to the water to go swim or do other things, but most of our life is out on land because we developed the adaptations to do that. And so, again, like I said, the kidneys, the amniotic egg, the skin, the fur, all these different things that allow us to survive. Okay, and with that, we made it to the end of this lecture. If you do have any questions, please feel free to ask, send me emails and that stuff. I'm glad you're keeping up with these things. Hopefully they're entertaining and you're learning something out of these things. And I'll see you next time.